So, um, so yesterday we discussed the ADHM equations, which describe the moduli space of a framed instantons. So I didn't uh, introduce the terminology yesterday. So instantons are the solutions of the equation. The self-dual part of the curve which is equal to 0. And framed means that we uh, identify the gauge equivalent solutions of these equations, uh, of these equations uh, uh, with the requirement that the, these gauge transformations approach 1 as x goes to infinity. So uh, the resulting space, which I denoted by m plus k, I should probably introduce the second label for the rank. So we'll be talking about the UN instantons. Uh, so this space has, a, uh, has an SUN symmetry. which comes from the possibility of performing a constant gauge summation. Uh, so I wanted, so I claimed that uh, there is a certain compactness theorem, which one can prove in this case, which is useful in analyzing the partition function. Uh, so let me state this theorem. So in addition to the SUN symmetry, uh, we also have the action of the uh, group U2. So this is the group of uh, rotations. In fact, let me work with this spin cover. So these are the rotations of R4. And uh, the, the equations, the original equations, uh, are invariant under all. Uh, symmetries of R4. In fact, they're invariant under, under the um, uh, conformal symmetries. But we uh, introduced certain deformation when we discussed the compactification of the, of the moduli space, which was uh, adding to the to the uh, so-called real moment map equation, a constant. Uh, so this is eta positive. So this deformation breaks uh, breaks the rotational symmetry from a sp spin four down to u two. This deformation uses a specific complex structure um, on R four. Uh, so uh, I, in, in order to single out one equation out of three, so the, the other two were combined into the holomorphic equation, I have to distinguish a specific pa pair of holomorphic coordinates. And so, so this is uh, the resulting symmetry. Uh, so it basically acts on B1 and B2 as a doublet. I is invariant, and J uh, transforms uh, as a determinant representation. So it's a so there is a uh, so you, you uh, so if T is in uh, U two, you act so T is a two by two matrix. You act with this matrix on B one B two, and you multiply J by the determinant of this matrix. So the commutator of B1, B2 will, will be multiplied by this determinant, and that's why this equation is, is, is compatible with the symmetry. Now, uh, so this is a big group. And uh, in applications where we only use its maximal torus, so let me denote it as the torus of rotations. Um, so if you look at the fixed point, set of fixed points under the maximal torus, 
and the maximal torus of the uh, of the group of the constant gauge transformations. Uh, so those fixed points we classified yesterday, and they were simply isolated. There was, there was a finite number of those points. So T rotation cross T gauge fixed points. are uh, antipoles of uh, partitions uh, whose total size is equal to k. So each partition is, uh, is a Young diagram. So this is lambda alpha for one of the values of alpha. And the size of the partition is the number of uh, squares. So each square, remember, each square was, the, was a, a vector in the k-dimensional vector space. And so if, if, I, uh, if you take a, uh, if you have a vector, if I have a square with coordinates i and j, j goes here, i goes here, then uh, this vector, uh, so alpha i j, this is the vector b1 to the power i minus 1, b2 to the power j minus 1. I applied to the uh, one-dimensional uh, vector, uh, the eigenvector um, of the uh, transformation from the global gauge rotations corresponding to the eigenvalue e to the i alpha. E to the a alpha, sorry. Um, so this is, uh, so, th uh, so this is uh, the situation when you have the full maximal torus at your disposal but it may happen that uh, the, uh, the problem you are solving forces you to consider special specific values of the uh, equivalent parameters. So so if these parameters epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are not generic, uh, you, you, uh, you, will, you may not have the full torus at your disposal. So remember, OK, so this is my, my two-dimensional torus. And the epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 gives me, give me a direction, a specific uh, slope for the one parametric group, which is spent by, uh, generated by, by this transformation. So if I start iterating it, put some coefficient s, I will generate a one parametric subgroup. So if the ratio epsilon 1, epsilon 2 is, uh, is not rational, then the subgroup will actually fill the torus densely. And that means that you have uh, uh, the whole torus at your disposal. And so the set of fixed points is precisely that. But if this ratio is rational, then you actually have only Uh, only one dimensional uh, symmetry group. So then uh, this is this spans S1, with like U1 embedded into U1 cross U1 at some rational slope. And so since this group is strictly smaller than, than the uh, maximal torus, the set of fixed points will be uh, strictly larger. And um, need not be isolated. So these points are isolated. Okay. Well, this is my moduli space. So let's say this is my moduli space. And so this is, the pic this is the picture of these fixed points.
So these are just examples of, of these fixed points in the, for the case of general epsilons. But is, if the epsilons are not generic, then what happens is that these points become uh, form continuous submanifolds. So this is what happens for non-generic epsilons. In fact, if, if uh, you further reduce the symmetry group, namely you start playing with, the, with Coulomb parameters, the parameters which the generators of the global symmetry transformations, uh, your set of fixed points becomes even larger and actually can go off to infinity. So this is what happens if A alphas are not generic. And that's dangerous for the, uh, that's kind of bad for the partition function. That means that you actually have integrated out something which is massless, can run away to infinity. And so that means that uh, uh, that signals actual singularity of the partition function. And, uh, requires further analysis. But um, so if so I'm uh, but I claim that if the differences between uh, 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 between the Coulomb parameters, so the different eigenvalues are not of the form epsilon one times a positive integer plus epsilon two times a positive integer then this never happens. Then this uh, the fixed point set is always compact. So let me prove it. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there is a case when you specify a to the value that in front is number of diagrams. Say, say what? So you specify a yes. parameter to truncate number of diagrams, whereas it's choices. No, no, no. It, it, not, not in this situation. Not in this case. Not in this situation. Case. Case. So, so this is, uh, uh, so if you, if I, uh, we will consider the theory with matter. We'll have uh, other types of parameters, which are the masses. And so those correspond to, those can be used to truncate the, num the size of Young diagrams. So those correspond to the possibility of adding new equations to the set of equations I've written before. And so when you add more equations, you, you restrict the moduli space. So what happens then is that your moduli space becomes strictly smaller. So you go to vertices. To vertices. Vertices? Vertices. Vertices. It could be, some, well, sometimes it's interpreted, it could be interpreted as vertices, sometimes it could be interp interpreted as something else. But uh, uh, that's the, that's what you do. So you have extra equations from extra matter. We'll do that momentarily because we will need to consider theories which uh, correspond to asymptotically superconformal theories. And for those theories, the modular space which we'll be integrating over will be of virtual dimension zero. So ultimately, you won't actually want to count points, some points. Um, but uh, uh, but right now, the, so th but these quantities appear in denominator of localization formula. And so they lead to the poles if something is non-generic. What uh, Maxim is asking is, is in, the, uh, in, the theory, in theories with matter, you have numerators in the localization contribution. And so those can vanish, so which simplify, the, simplify life uh, sometimes. OK, so, uh, this is, uh, so the reason I want to present this compactness theorem is because it's a kind of baby version of a, of a uh, more uh, complicated story, which leads to the non-perturbative dyson schwinger equations. Okay, so uh, so 
So I claim that, uh, so, so uh, let me assume from the very beginning that uh, the parameters epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, so these are the infinitesimal uh, rotations of, of, uh, of, of space-time, uh, that they are integers. I can rescale them. If, if the ratio is rational, I can I rescale them so that they're integers. And so the, what, what we're looking at, we're looking at the solutions of the following equations. So this is the infinitesimal version of the equations which I wrote yesterday, hopefully without uh, the typos which I had yesterday. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll see that in a moment. So what this equation says that is that if I uh, do infinitesimal rotation of B1 and B2, I can undo that by the uh, uh, infinitesimal UK symmetry. So this is. And now, uh, remember, there was a statement that you can, instead of solving this real map equation with zeta, uh, and then dividing by the group UK, you can actually you forget about this equation. You impose a stability condition, which is phrased in, in holomorphic terms. And then you divide by the group of general linear transformations. And so that allows you to think of phi as a general just k by k matrix. So then uh, I is acted on by the uh, so let me write this like this so this is phi a so a is the diagonal matrix with eigenvalues a1 a n i is the map from n to k and so phi is this compensating transformation which acts from the space case k to itself and finally Epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 j minus j a is equal to, uh, sorry, minus a j is equal to uh, j phi. So this, this sum epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 is the linearization of, it's a logarithm of this determinant. So what this equation say, as I said, is, is that the infinitesimal rotation and the uh, global gauge transformation can be undone by the, uh, by the local GLK transformation. So this defines the fixed points, the set of fixed points uh, which we, we want to uh, uh, study. And uh, so what we said yesterday was that from this equation, it, well, we, we know that i cannot be 0, because if i were 0, then this, this, this condition would not be satisfied. So it means that at least one component of phi is non-zero. So it means that at least one of the eigenvalues of phi has to be equal to the eigenvalue of a. And uh, so the spectrum of phi has the form So this part comes from uh, acting on the eigenvector of phi with b1 and b2. So this is like in supersymmetry by, by looking at this equation. If uh, psi is the eigenvector of, of uh, phi with eigenvalue lambda, then b1 times psi will be again be an eigenvector using this equation. So I'm using that the commutator of phi with b1 is equal to epsilon b1. So I can pull it like here. And so what I get is uh, lambda plus epsilon 1 times b1 psi. So if it means that if, if this vector is not killed by b1, then it is an eigenvector of phi with the new eigenvalue 
which is which is lambda plus epsilon one, and so by acting with b one and b two, you generate these shifts. And that f and from this it follows that j has to vanish because uh, for j th these eigenvalues go in a different direction. You see, j wants to subtract from a some combination of epsilon one plus epsilon two. So uh, this argument works when the s signs of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are uh, the same. So if they're of, of, of equal sign. So for p and q both, let's say, positive or negative, we I mean, by a scaling, I can always assume, let's say, that q is positive. Um, and I'm assuming that uh, both p and q are not equal to 0. So that's important for compactness theorem. Otherwise, it will not work. So this is an important assumption. So, you, so if this is the case, then by these arguments, you conclude that j is 0. If the signs on p and q are, are opposite, then you cannot use this argument because, well, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, for example, could even vanish. And so it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter. So that would not be enough to conclude that j uh, is equal to 0. We'll need to argue differently. But let's first dispose of this case. It's actually, it's more complicated than, than others. Um, so the idea is the following. Uh, well, first of all, if A's are generic, we can actually split the space K into the subspaces such that phi restricted on the subspace K alpha is, well, K alpha is simply So, and under my assumption that epsilon 1, epsilon 2 are integers, positive integers, well, this is some non negative integer. So, the spectrum of phi consists of uh, possibly of several arithmetic progressions which start at uh, different uh, complex numbers a alpha, and so we can sp separate the, the space into the orthogonal uh, summons corresponding to different values of alpha. So it's enough to it's actually enough to uh, understand it for fixed value of alpha because they don't they don't they don't talk to each other and therefore uh, so what I want to do I want to find I want to find the bound on the norm squared of find a bound on, on, on the norm of, uh, of all these matrices. Since we just proved that j equals to 0, well, it makes life easier. And in fact, the norm of i, you can compute from the real map equation, um, but we'll not do that. Uh, what we will do is the following trick. So, so I, I now. I work at fixed alpha, and so by shifting a, I can assume that a alpha is equal to 0. It doesn't really matter. So my equations now have the following form. This is 0. I forget about this. This is p, and this is q. So I want to uh, find some bound on, on, on this norm. Well, uh, so we now can split the space k alpha into, in turn, as a sum of the subspaces on which phi has eigenvalue. Okay. 
k alpha n is the kernel of phi minus n. So n is a uh, non-negative non integer. So the question is, uh, well, we ca so this integer can be arbitrarily large. Not too large, because the, I mean the dimension of k is fixed. So we cannot have more than k little k values for this number n. But the danger is to have the matrices be with uh, matrix elements which are arbitrarily high, arbitrarily large. So what we want to show is that even though these are not isolated fixed points, they actually sit inside some big ball in this modular space. So this is what we want to find. We want to find the bound on the, on the size of this ball. OK, so uh, let's compute. Let me define the following quantity. Delta sub n, it's a trace over the subspace k uh, alpha n of, um, so it's b1, b1 dagger plus b2, b2 dagger plus i, i dagger. So you see, b1, when acting on, on the space k alpha n, sends it to the space k alpha n plus p. And b2 this is exactly the, the repetition of this argument. And b dagger acts in, map, it acts in the opposite direction. So the norm which I wanted to compute is just the sum of, of, of these partial norms. So now we need to find some, some identity uh, for, for these norms. And what we can do, we can, using the real moment map equation, so here for, for this norm analysis, I'm using the uh, unitary uh, picture. So I'm only dividing by the unitary, unitary to summations UK and using the real moment equation. So from this equation, so I'm using the j is equal to 0. So what you can see is that this guy is almost what everything that you see on the left hand side. What you see on the left hand side is BB dagger plus II dagger minus B dagger B. So we can rewrite this as 1 over zeta trace K alpha N zeta times 1 plus B1 dagger B1 plus b2 dagger b2. Just, this is just the algebraic manipulation. And now, using this property, well, you see that now b1 takes this space in and pushes it further into the space with eigenvariant plus p. b2 does it with the uh, maps to the space n plus q. So you can estimate. use the fact that the trace uh, uh, is cyclic. So you can ask, so this is the dimension of the space k of n from this unit. And then you can estimate it by delta of n plus p plus delta n plus q. So you get some kind of nest telescopic sequence of telescopic inequalities. And uh, eventually, so, so you use these inequalities, you, you effectively increase the value of n until you get to the point when the space k alpha n is simply 0. So, it's a, so k alpha n is 0 for n much bigger, let's say, than k, just bigger than k. Yes. So from that, you can get an estimate. 
And the conservative estimate is rather uh, high, but it doesn't matter. It's finite. Could you repeat again how you found it, V1 double V1? OK. So, uh, so this is the definition. So this is the real moment of equation. So now I want to, I'm claiming the following. So the trace in the space k alpha n of b1 dagger b1, I want to rewrite as a trace of the space k alpha n plus p of b1 b1 dagger. So, norm, so un normally under the trace you can exchange but you have to be careful with the w in which spaces the, the operators act. So B1 acts from k alpha n to k alpha n plus p. And so now, since in this formula, k alpha n plus p appears outside, that's the space of which I'm, I'm taking the trace. And so this is less than equal to the same quantity where I'm adding something which is non-negative, namely B2, B2 dagger plus I, I dagger. So this is a very conservative estimate. I mean, I'm, this is small, and I'm increasing it by, which is, uh, so if I divide by zeta, this is delta n plus p. So uh, you can intro uh, introduce the generalized Fibonacci numbers for this problem uh, to kind of package this. So usual Fibonacci numbers are solving the equation of that kind, I think. Right. So the generalized Fibonacci uh, so you start with f1 equals 1, f less than 0 equals to 0, and then you impose this condition. Right. So just like for ordinary Fibonacci numbers, you can write a formula using the uh, eigenvalues of the 2 by 2 matrix. So here you solve the Fermat equation, lambda to the p plus lambda to the q is equal to 1. So it has uh, max of p and q solutions. And so in terms of, so you can write the formula for f of n as a sum over all solutions of this equation, lambda to the n, and some prefactors, dimensional conditions. The point is that it, it's, it shows that these numbers, they grow, but at most exponentially. So there is some, so there is some constant by which you can bound them. And from these inequalities, So the inequalities of that type, delta n is less than uh, k plus delta n plus p plus delta n plus q. Again, I'm making conservative estimates. I'm in inc increasing the right-hand side. It follows that uh, delta n is less than equal to the sum k n, n plus p prime fn plus prime plus 1, which means that this is can be bound by k exponential k. Say it again? Should it be the minus p? Yes, but that's probably the same. You can uh, multiply it by, uh, oh, OK, maybe I won't. Right, uh, so uh, it follows that the sum over delta n has some finite bound. Okay, so that's that's the that's the way this argument works. Um, it's a li little bit of work, but not too much. 
and for uh, oh, sorry. Now, when P and Q have the opposite signs, then the following trick works. If P, Q is less than 0, well, first of all, you need to prove that J equals to 0 uh, uh, because now you, you cannot use the eigenvalues. Uh, I claim that nevertheless, nevertheless. Uh, so how do I, do, I, do I prove that? Well, uh, so I must. Let me assume now that n is one-dimensional. So this is what we did here. We split. Uh, so the the problem splits into n abelian problems uh, when when the Coulomb parameters are generic. And so let me do it now for in the abelian case. Uh, so the equation b1, the commutator of b1, b2 plus ij equals to 0. Let me take the trace of this equation. So it will imply that ji is equal to 0. So now, you see, I, normally I would, I would have to put a trace here. But, but trace of the 1 by 1 matrix is equal to the matrix itself. So this is because, so I was acting from n to k. So this, this is the n to n operator, which is one dimensional. So it's a number. So j, uh, j annihilates the image of I. Now, by if I multiply this equation by b1 or b2, in fact, if I multiply it by any power of a linear combination of b1 and b2 and take a trace, so this is 0 because, because of the moment my equation. But now, if you look carefully, you can rewrite this as the commutator of alpha b1 plus beta b2 gamma b1 plus delta b2 provided that alpha delta minus beta gamma is equal to 1. And now you see you have the, the power of the matrix times the commutator of this matrix with something, and then you take a trace. So that means that that part of the trace is 0. And so you are left with uh, j multiplying uh, alpha b1 plus beta b2 to the power n for any alpha, beta, and n. So um, if you knew that b1 and b2 were commuting, that would imply that uh, so j vanishes on uh, any uh, polynomial of b1, b2 applied to i, which is by the stability assumption is equal to k, which means that j vanishes on k, which means that j vanishes. Uh, but uh, b1 and b2 may not commute, but that's OK, because now if you try to insert a commutator of b1, b2 into some word involving b's i and j here, you can use the moment map equation to replace it by as a product of two words. And so by induction, if you, if you prove that all word for uh, j annihilates uh, all words in, le in letters b1 and b2 acting on i up to the, uh, let's say, depth k, then by this argument, uh, if you have a longer word, and then ins inside you have a commutator of b1 and b2, that vanishes. That means that inside this, inside this uh, 
in, uh, when you close uh, any word with b's uh, uh, by j, inside b's effectively commute. And that means that uh, this argument works, j vanishes, and then it means that actually they do commute, because if j is 0, then b1 commutator would be 2 is equal to 0. OK, so uh, that's uh, nice, but that's still not the, the full story. But actually, the full story is almost over. I claim that if this is the case, if epsilon 1, epsilon 2 are rational in rational relation with opposite signs, then actually the, uh, the corresponding fixed point is invariant under the full two-dimensional torus. So if pq is less than 1, actually it follows that any epsilon 1, epsilon 2 uh, fix this configuration. And that's, this is how we prove it. Look at the following operator. So suppose uh, p less than 0, q is greater than 0. So I will raise b1 to the power q, b2 to the power minus p. So if p is negative, this is positive, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an allowed operator. Well, from these fixed point equations, it follows that phi commutes with n. Because the, the weight of this combination is actually 0. So b1 has weight p, and b2 has weight q. So p times q minus p times q is equal to 0. And uh, so uh, n, so n, uh, okay, let me call it curly n. So curly n is a, is a nilpotent operator. which commutes with the u1, which is generated by this epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Therefore, uh, so if I decompose k as a sum of the eigenspaces, so these are the eigenspaces of phi, so u1 is generated by phi in, in, in a sense. Each space Kn is invariant, is invariant under the action of this nilpotent operator. And then there is a theorem by uh, Jacobson and uh, Morozov, which says that uh, uh, a nilpotent operator can be included into the S in, the, in the SL2 subalgebra. So it follows that ex there exist operators uh, H and N, N star such that commutator of n h with n uh, is n, commutator with h with n star is minus n star, and n with n star is twice h. And so this h becomes a second grading. So that Kn can be further split into the K and M. And that means that now you have the U1 cross U1 symmetry. So H and phi. And then we're back in business as yesterday. So we have the full uh, two-dimensional torus of symmetries. So that proves that uh, as long as both epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are non-zero, so this is what I used, you, um, the set of fixed points will be c is compact. OK, so now let me say something new. Um, so, so far, we discussed pure n equals 2 d equals 4 theory. Let's add some matter.
it is convenient to, in some sense, uh, uh, so if you want to add matter uh, while preserving the asymptotic freedom of the theory, uh, and so if, you, if we only add matter in the fundamental uh, or by fundamental representation, if you have a product of uh, unitary groups as a gauge group, uh, then the choices are actually limited. So you only uh, can work with quivers quiver theories, and the, the condition that the theory is asymptotically free or asymptotically conformal means that these quivers have to be of the ADE type, either a fine Dinkin diagrams of, of ADE type or finite Dinkin diagram of ADE type. And that means, in, in turn, that uh, the matter content of, this the of the theory can be obtained by certain orbifold truncation from the n equals 4 theory. So it's all can be gotten by orbifolds of n equals 4 superannual theory with maybe bigger, much bigger gauge group, possibly with, with some massive deformation. So it could be n equals 2 star theory. And so let me uh, simply explain what happens to the ADHM data when we pass from n equals 2 theory to n equals 4 theory, uh, because everything else will be a uh, straightforward or default uh, truncation. Now, unfortunately, unlike the, the pure instanton case where there was this nice reciprocity theorem mapping ADHM data to gauge fields and, and, and back and forth, uh, in the n equals 4 case, I, I'm not aware of, of such theorems, so what I'm going to present will be really construction by analogy, not, not uh, systematic derivation. So n equals 4 gauge theory has, uh, in addition to the gauge field, it has six scalars. Right? which uh, we can organize into the complex scalar sigma and its conjugate as an equals two case. And the other four, I will uh, twist, let's say, in the waffle witten way. And so they will become a scalar and the cell dual two form. And so A is the, uh, remains the gauge field. So this is done in order to uh, give a certain, give some, give certain mathematical structure to the localization equations which uh, we will be analyzing. Again, I'm working on, on flat space on R4. So we, in fact, I'm not changing my theory in, in any way. You can actually just use some flavor, flavor indices to label, to label your, your fields, uh, but I will single out one of the supercharges out of 16 supercharges of this theory. And that, from the point of view of that supercharge, it's convenient to write the theory in this way. So the equations in which we will be localizing our theory will be certain deformation of the instanton equations. Um, I think it starts like this. So you add the commutator of the self-dual two form with the scalar. And then there is another term where with some gymnastics, you can produce a bilinear map from cell dual two forms into cell dual two forms. And then there is an equation that dA. So this is just cross product, right? Yeah, it's some kind of cross product. Uh, it's the, uh, so if you think about the cell dual two forms as a triplet of SU2, there is a. Uh, well, it's a triplet of SU2 times the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra. And so you have the. Uh, this is three dimensional space, that's it, right? Well, it's not three dimensional, it's a three, three times the Lie algebra, right? It's a, it's right. There is a Lie algebra structure it's there. Oh, you mean you there is also a structure, there's also structure constants. Anyway, but. Uh, and then, uh, gosh, so what is the. 
so I guess, so this here I want to write an equation of this type, I think. So, th so this equation va is valued in the, again, in self-dual two forms, valued in the, in the adjoint bundle. And this equation is valued in, the, in one forms. Yes, well, on, on R4 it's kind of tricky because it's non compact, so you, you have to be careful. Uh, presumably, with some vanishing conditions at infinity, these equations imply that B and C are actually equal to zero. But the point is that uh, uh, now that you have more fields and more equations, and you produce the supersymmetric, uh, I mean, the, the path integral over these fields and their superpartners, even though Physically, it will reduce to the same, in the, to the integral over the same modulus space of instantons because on solutions B and C vanish. So these equations imply that B and C equals to zero. But since you use more fermions to impose these equations, the actual measure of integration over the modulus space of instantons will be not one, as in the n equals two case but it will be essentially the Euler class of the tangent bundle or cotangent bundle. So you have set the sigma and sigma bar to zero? Sigma and sigma bar are the, so they, they are in the equivariant multiplet. So, so if you like, there is also the equation of this form. This part is not changed. I'm not, uh, this is, So uh, I mean I'm working in the paradigm of fields, equations, and symmetries, and so this is this is the part of the symmetry multiplet. These are the equations, and these are my fields. So what's nice about these equations is that they actually kind of match the set of fields. Previously we had the fields were one forms, but the equations were self-dual two forms, and the symmetry w were scalars. So there was some some mismatch. You were you were comparing one forms to uh, so in n equals two case, you're comparing one forms to self-dual two forms and scalars. But here, we have one forms here, one forms here, and we have self-dual two forms here, self-dual two forms here, and we have a scalar here and a scalar in the symmetry. And so that's a, this is an example of what uh, Digraph uh, and Moore called the balanced topological uh, theory. So we can mimic, uh, right, sorry, uh, one, one more thing. So these equations you can actually derive from some kind of superpotential. Namely, if you look carefully, you'll see that uh, you can write some kind of functional, which is like integral trace B plus wedge F A plus plus, uh, I think some kind of some sort of Chern Simons action plus one third B cross B. So if I vary this functional W with respect to B, I'll get the first equation. And if I vary it with respect to A, and I didn't make a mistake, maybe I did make a mistake. Um, ah. I will not get the second equation, but uh, the second equation means that the gradient of, uh, so maybe I make, made a mistake in the first equation. So the gradient, uh, so the variation of W respect to A is equal to the gauge transformation generated by C. So maybe I don't need this, this part. And the variation of W with respect to B plus is the gauge summation of B generated by C. So these equations are kind of generalized gradient flow equations. Um, so that's what we will uh, mimic in the ADHM con on the ADHM construction. So I claim that in order to produce the same measure, which I just <laughs> raised, the Euler class uh, on the modular space of instantons, 
the adhesion data will have to be supplemented by two more matrices. And the equations will be now, uh, so I will have more equations. So the first equation So I start with the ADHM equation as a complex moment map, but then I add to it the conjugate of the commutator of B3 and B4. So somehow you should see part of it in, in, in this structure. You see, if I choose complex structure on R4, then B plus can splits as B to zero plus B one one omega plus B zero two, which, which is conjugate. And so B to zero is like B three and B one one omega plus I C is like B four in, in, in this notation. And then I will have equations B one commutator with B three plus uh, B4 commutator would be 2 dagger is equal to 0. B1, B4 plus B2, B3 dagger is equal to 0. And finally, the, oh, not finally. So then there is equation B1, B1 dagger plus B2, B2 dagger. Okay, let me write in a more concise way the sum of all four commutators plus i, i dagger minus j dagger j is equal to zeta. And finally, b3i minus plus j uh, b4 dagger is equal to 0. And b4i minus j b3 dagger is equal to 0. So uh, so you can compare these equations to the uh, to the equations which follow from the superpotential. So the superpotential will will not uh, respect the symmetry of rotation of four matrices. It will be something like B. Uh, Three commutator B1, B2 plus IJ. And the equations will be that the gradient of W respect to the field, commission conjugate, is equal to the gauge variation of this field X generated, generated by B4. So, if, for example, if, if X is B3, the derivative of W respect to B3. Is the left is the first part of the addition equation, and then the uh, gauge transformation of B3 is a commutator of B3 with B4, and so you, and you take commission conjugate. So that's the first equation. And if you take the variation with respect to J, you'll get B3 times I, and so B3 times I, and this is uh, minus J B B4 is the gauge variation of J. So that's the logic here. Again, so here there is a vanishing theorem, which is easy to prove uh, that these equations imply that B3 and B4 are equal to 0 when z is positive. But now if you set up the calculation, the integration of 1 over the modulus space of solutions of these equations, and now you have more symmetry, so the symmetry is uh, u4, is su4. Um, sorry, uh, it's not quite SU4. It's the maximal torus of SU4. So you can multiply matrices BA by any phases. 
provided that the product of these phases is equal to 1. So the first equation, you, can mu you multiply uh, the commutator of B1, B2 by T1, T2. And this, and this commutator of B3 and B4 is multiplied by T3, T4, which is inverse of T1, T2 by this condition. So it means that compared to the n equals 2 case, where we had uh, two uh, epsilon parameters, the parameters of rotation, here we have three parameters. So we have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and epsilon 4, which is negative epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus epsilon 3. The meaning, the physical meaning of these parameters is, uh, so epsilon 1, epsilon 2 correspond to the rotations of space-time, and epsilon 3 is the mass of the adjoint hypermultiplet. So this is the mass of adjoint hypermultiplet. So now, if you do the uh, localization computation of uh, for the integral of the solution of the modular space of solutions to these equations, which means literally what? It means that you, uh, for every variable here, so you have. Uh, six types of complex variables or you know eight Hermitian matrices and uh, four uh, and two uh, and four uh, rectangular matrices you introduce the variable fermionic variable of the same type and then for each equation you introduce uh, a pair of boson and fermion the auxiliary uh, the Lagrange multiplier for the equation and its fermionic partner and then for the symmetry so the symmetry is UK you also introduce uh, a small multiplet like sigma, sigma bar, and eta. And then you write the standard uh, homological field theory uh, Lagrangian, which enforces these equations and takes care of the symmetry, which you deform using this uh, global symmetry and the global framing symmetry, which still acts on i and j. Then, uh, the result would be the partition function, which is the sum, again, the sum over all n tuples of partitions. And then you'll get the product of the eigenvalues of phi acting on the tangent space to the modular space of instantons at the corresponding n-tuples of partitions. Let me call them lambda. So these lambdas have the form, uh, the, they have the form, the differences of, of the Coulomb parameters plus um, integral linear combinations of epsilon 1, epsilon 2. And now you'll have in the numerator um, the same eigenvalues shifted by epsilon 3. And even though it's not obvious, uh, this, exp this expression is actually symmetric under exchanges of epsilon 3 and epsilon 4. So these equations, these equations were completely symmetric. Uh, there was no preferred, uh, I mean, there was no well, I can exchange B3 with B4 and B4 with negative B3. The equations remain the same. And so there should be a symmetry which exchanges these parameters. And it means that when I call epsilon 3 a mass of the adjoint hypermultiplet, I could equally well call epsilon 4 the mass of the adjoint hypermultiplet. So uh, the notion of mass is, is, is slightly ambiguous in the mega background. So, so you said that in this case the, the proof is not known, but at least you can kind of construct the explicit form of the gauge field, et cetera, from given this no, that's what I w this is what I don't know. I mean, oh, 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 sorry. Of course, the equations, since the equations imply that B3 and B4 equals to 0, the equations reduce to the old DHM equations. Uh. So, of course, uh, in the, at the level of, uh, at the set theoretical level, of course, you have the correspondence. So you get, it's the old instanton, which you get from the old B1, B2, I, and J. But these equations have the meaning themselves, even though 
the solutions are simple, but the equations are more important than the than solutions. And uh, it, uh, somehow I, I would like to have a way of connecting the equations to the equations without assuming that that the equations imply this thing. Because also, uh, if you instead of R four you work on some other manifold, the, the vanishing theorem is does not hold. And so then you have other. Anyway, um, so from this, uh, by looking at these equations and observing that it, uh, they, these equations have a symmetry, uh, let's say SU2 symmetry, which rotates B1 into B2, you can perform some orbifolds which will uh, replace this R4 space time by, by the ALE space. That's one option. There's not another SU2 symmetry. So the symmetry, which is uh, these equations actually have is is a product of SU2 cross U1 cross SU2. So this SU2 acts on B1, B2 as a doublet. This SU, SU2 acts on B3 and B4 as a doublet. And this U1 scales simultaneously B1, B2 and scales in opposite way B3 and B4. So if you have a discrete subgroup of this SU2 or if you have a discrete subgroup of this SU2, and so there are AD, AD classifications of such subgroups. You can impose additional equivalence condition on these subgroups and produce other equations which would correspond, which will produce the ADHM data for quiver gauge theories. So from, from this you get for free, essentially, you get um, So these are quiver gauge theories on R4, or if you also uh, impose the orbifold projection by gamma 1, it will be quiver gauge theories on R4 mode, mode gamma 1. But now you can say, you can observe one thing, that uh, here you have some kind of symmetry be 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 between 1, 2 space and 3, 4 space, and these two procedures look symmetric. But the equations are not quite symmetric because you have ij, which couples to b1, b2, but nothing couples to b3, b4. And so you can try to fix that symmetry by introducing one more set of fields, more data. So we introduce new space n tilde, and maps i tilde, which maps n tilde to k, j tilde, which maps k to n tilde. And modify these equations. Uh, so here we add additional terms into the re real Moffat map. And then uh, now symmetrically, so B3 wants to annihilate I. So B1 wants to annihilate I tilde. So now life looks truly symmetric. So what, this, what these equations describe? They describe the uh, instantons which live on uh, intersecting worlds. So in the, in the brain world picture, in the brain world picture, you have n brains which span R4 with complex coordinates Z1 and Z2. And then there is n tilde brains which live on C2 with coordinates Z3 and Z4. And these two complex planes intersect at one point. And this is the point where there is some interaction between, uh, between this data. So these equations imply that separately B1, B2 plus Ij equals to 0. So this, is, this follows from these equations. And separately B3, B4. 
plus i tilde j tilde is equal to 0. So this is the DHM equation for instantons. So you get un instantons on C2, 1, 2. And you get un tilde instantons on C2, 3, 4. But you don't know in advance what, what is the instanton charge of these solutions. And uh, so, so you may have the solution where you have charge k1 on, on, on this plane, k1, 2, and charge k3, 4 on that plane, complex plane, so on that four dimensional space. And the sum of these charges is greater than or equal to k. So some of these instantons are actually shared by, by both, uh, both um, planes. And so in what sense are they shared? Well, it, this is algebraic condition. So the, what we need to do, we need to look at the space generated by applying uh, to the image of i uh, polynomials in b1, b2. So this is the space k12. And Similarly, with uh, B3, B4, I tilde, and tilde. And so these two spaces, they sum should be equal to K. So this is the stability condition. This is what follows from this equation when Z is positive. But these two spaces may intersect. And so the, the intersection, the dimension of intersection, this is the number of instantons trapped at the intersection. So I call the intersection the cross. And, and this modular space is a modular space of crossed instantons. So they live on the cross, on continuing the cross. Um, now, you, what you, you, the game which you can, you can now play, so there's a partition function for, for this crossed instanton uh, configuration. You can first integrate out instantons living on one plane, and that will produce an observable in the theory on the second plane. And then uh, the compactness theorem, which again holds, will imply that as a function of certain equivariant parameters, which from the point of view of, of the observable living on the horizontal plane, are uh, just some spectral, auxiliary spectral parameters, the correlation functions of those observables have no poles. And from that follows uh, follow the Eisenschmigger equations. So compactness theorem implies regularity of correlation functions. implies word identities of safety, actually. So the, from these dyson schwinger equations, one derives BPZ and KZ equations of two-dimensional conformal field theories. So that's, the, that's uh, let me just say that, that I'm, I'm done, finished. Thank you. Now the questions. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. The, the fact that in some instance the charge is shared by yes. 1, 2, and 3, 4 seems to mean that they kind of make a bound state or interact together. But, the, the, but still you're solving the, 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 long, the actual solution you are constructing seems to be the self dual solution, not, not the more complicated solution. So, <laughs> so um, it's kind of talk with each other, but the profile is not affected. So well, you see, the point is that they, they, well, they talk to each other in, in particular uh, through the real moment, map, real moment map equation. So in order to produce the instant on gauge field via usual ADHM construction, you need this equation and the real moment map equation, which involves only B1 and B2 and I and J, not, not B3, B4. So nobody, so I don't know how to produce something like a gauge field using solutions of these equations, oh, because oh, because now once once you add a second brain, second set of brains, it is not true that B three and B four is zero. So this is this is not no longer zero. Uh, so so uh, qualitatively, 
I mean, there are solutions for which these two parts are very far away, separated. Yeah. And so then approximately, you can construct instantons of small charge, of some charge k12 living here and instantons living here. But what happens differential geometrically when they all come together, nobody knows. This here, it's only the algebraic geometric description which works, only in terms of the you know, holomorphic data, not in terms of the differential geometric data. So the fixed points, maybe last one, one last two marks. So the fixed points on this modular space consist now of two types of Young diagrams. So some Young diagrams grow in directions epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and other Young diagrams grow in directions epsilon 3 and epsilon 4. And uh, so generically, they have separated in the complex plane, but sometimes they touch. And so when, touch, when they touch is when the possible poles may appear, but then the compactness theorem that the poles actually cancels. Cancel. So this configuration I call the butterfly. When two young diagrams start touching, so kind of, these are like wings of the butterfly. Um, and to the observer who lives on, on, the, on, 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 uh, on the horizontal plane, uh, things look in a slightly mysterious way because it appears that the instanton can actually disappear. So, uh, so you can lose, so you start with the configuration of instanton charge K and then one, so one box of Young diagram can, can disappear, gets chipped off. It doesn't disappear in the combined system because it just goes, goes off into the, into, into the other direction. And so this is what happens when these two diagrams kiss each other. So they kiss, and then the box disappears in one diagram and gets attached to another diagram. And so the, the, the poles uh, uh, cancel between these two contributions. Maybe I should describe the, the, so the, solution, the, space, the solutions of these um, equations in the case of k equals 1. Maybe it's, it's, it's helpful. Helpful. Uh, so if k equals to 1 and n equals to 1 and n tilde is equal to 1, so everything is one dimensional, then uh, all matrices are just numbers, all commutators uh, vanish. Uh, so you have very simple equations to, to deal with. Oh, yes, I forgot one more equation. So, so J tilde uh, I minus I tilde dagger J equals dagger equals to zero. Uh, so one proves very s quickly that J actually vanishes. And so the equations which you have are, uh, you only need to look at these equations. So. Uh, B3 i equals to 0, B4 i equals to 0, B1 uh, i tilde is equal to 0, B2 i tilde is equal to 0. And these are all numbers. So B a is just a complex number, i is a complex number, i tilde is a complex number. And then you have a real moment of equation which says that the absolute value squared of i plus absolute value squared of i tilde is equal to z. Zeta. So it's a. Uh, so this is a sphere. It's a three-dimensional sphere. But now uh, we have several branches. So if at least one of the numbers b3 or b4 is non-zero, then i equals to zero. And so you have a branch which is isomorphic to C2. So it's which is parameterized by b3 and b4. On this branch, i equals to zero then the norm of i tilde is fixed and up to gauge transformation i tilde can be uh, uh, set to be just square root of zeta so that's one branch so the inside this branch there is a special point when b3 and b4 vanish if they vanish then i may be non-zero similarly uh, there is a branch when uh, 
b1 and b2 are non-zero. So then i tilde is zero, and i is equal to square root of zeta. And then there is a special point zero when, when uh, i tilde may become non-zero. And then there is a the branch when all b are equal to zero. So these equations are solved uh, trivially. And here you have uh, S3 mod U1. So this is CP1 parameterized by the ratio i to i tilde. And so what this modulus space is, it's uh, you have one instanton which can sit either on the vertical vertical plane, so this is the, that branch, or it can s so somewhere away from the origin, or it can sit somewhere on the horizontal plane, or when it reaches the, this point, so this is the position of this instanton, reaches the intersection point, then it actually it starts thinking whether it wants to stay or it wants to go, and it has the whole sphere, two-dimensional sphere worth of choices. And so that's the extra component of this modular space. And so now in the, uh, in the classification of the fixed points, they uh, remember that we were supposed to have n tuples of Young diagrams. So n plus n tuple, n, n plus n tilde tuple of Young diagrams of total size 1. And so we have two choices, either one box empty or empty one box. And so these two choices are these two points. So these are these two fixed points in this case. And one of them is visible to the observer in the, on the horizontal plane, and another one is not visible. So when instanton has gone to a different branch, to us it seems that we lost instanton charge. But uh, once when everything is embedded in string theory, nothing is lost. So. Ghost string theory. Thank you.